Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Gold, Goats, and Guns podcast. My name is Tom Luongo. It is Wednesday, May 31st, 2017. So uh, we're going to have uh, some monthly closes today because this is the last day of May and that's going to be very important to uh, update uh, some of the charts that we're going to be going to want to look at this afternoon. I've got uh, that I want to talk about in gold and silver. I also want to talk about uh, some of the things that are happening geopolitically. Uh, specifically uh, Vladimir Putin meeting with uh, a newly minted French boy toy president, Emmanuel Macron. And uh, we've also got some earnings reports to uh, move through from our legacy uh, Resolute Wealth uh, portfolio. So let's get right to it. All right. All right. So let's <laughs> let's talk about uh, Putin's visit to France yesterday. So last fall, Putin um, canceled a trip to France because Francois Hollande, the sitting president at the time, refused to meet with him because he was, you know, being a virtue signaling little French frog, twat, whatever you want to call him. And uh, it's part of the reason why the man had a f exited office with a 4% approval rating. Um, and uh, Putin was going to to go to uh, open up, uh, to uh, inaugurate a, a cultural center uh, that was a uh, opening in France at the time, and, and uh, Hollande, Hollande blew him off. So Putin said, okay, fine, well, you're no longer important. I'm not coming. Um, so they took the, the opportunity to do that yesterday, along with uh, an opportunity to sit down with the new French president, who then proceeded to attempt to give Putin a history lesson about Russian and French relationships, uh, relations through time, and uh, to continue on this narrative idea in the, uh, the the press conference at the end of the, the meeting uh, that German Chancellor Angela Merkel tried when she was in Moscow last month, which was to talk about, you know, gay rights in Chechnya, which, you know, is a complete eye roller and humanitarian concerns and free press and all this stuff. And Putin's <laughs> just it's like, um, can we talk about business, please? Can we talk about, you know, why we don't really care whether or not you uh, lift the sanctions against us or not? Because they've been nothing but a boon to our economy. So, you know, this is just another instance of the leadership of the EU uh, continuing to virtue signal and fiddle while the continent burns. And I read something very interesting on Zero Hedge this morning. There's a uh, credit analyst or currency analyst over it. I think it's uh, Society General. What a shock. It's French bank. Saying that, oh, well, the whole EU going to disintegrate narrative is now tired and the euro is going to strengthen from here. And this is all just, you know, they've, they've weathered the storm. Like, really? Talk in your book, huh? All right. Got it. Uh, absolutely. Someone who does not have a clue as to what's actually going on. Uh, everything that the, I mean, maybe right in the short term, we may see a bounce to $1.13 on the euro, but so what? Um, so what? All that's doing is putting a whole lot of people offside, uh, which will create uh, an even bigger downdraft uh, when the euro starts to fall apart, which is honestly looking more and more like it's going to start in September. So we've got a couple of months here where we, you know, where any potential short positions in the euro are probably going to be put off for a little while. So, uh, and then, you know, of course, we're we're also moving into uh, the window where the next FOMC meeting is uh, due to take place in what, a week and a half or two weeks now. And uh, I, it, it's pretty much almost guaranteed at this point that the, the, the Fed's going to raise interest rates. So there would have to be a sincere sell-off in, um, in U.S. equities and a sincere bump up in the dollar between now and then for that to happen. And I don't see that happening. I see that the, the market sentiment is, is where it is, and it's already priced in at about an 85% level that uh, the Fed's going to raise rates in next week. And so, you know, everything's just kind of moving forward. And there are no short-term catalysts that we can see other than uh, the British snap elections next week, which I saw an interesting little poll yesterday about, that came from YouGov, with tremendously <laughs> wide variance on it. Uh, saying that, you know, the median case is, I guess, or the average case, wasn't the median case, was the average case, because with a, with a tremendous spread like that, <laughs> the median case is actually more interesting. So, of course, they reported the average case. And uh, 
for those of you who don't know the difference between an average, uh, an arithmetic average and a median, well, um, there's a Wikipedia. So the, um, so that, that poll had the Tories not, you know, like losing like 20 seats and that sent the, the British pound down 40 or 50 pips and, you know, the whole, this whole regalia, they're trying to create the, um, the narrative that somehow Theresa May doesn't have the support of the people uh, over a hard Brexit, while at the same time the EU comes out today with a painstakingly detailed uh, report of just what they expect the Brits to pay for on their way out the door. Um, and again, I told I told you weeks ago. I wrote this up in Seeking Alpha. I said this from the moment that Macron uh, was confirmed as the French president that they would double down on this suicidal pact to try and protect the eu from any uh from anybody leaving at all costs that they would double down on austerity against the greeks that they would double down on uh their build of brexit over brexit it's it's all crazy and you know i was looking i was thinking about this with with trump rolling up the g7 the other day and i might have mentioned this in the last podcast and i'm not really sure if i did because i wrote about it in a couple of different places both at halsey news and uh an article that went completely uh, nuts over at Seeking Alpha. You know, foreign Forex articles don't normally do 160 comments and 3,000 page hits, but this one did uh, because it ticked a lot of people off. And which is to say that when with Trump blowing up the G7 the other uh, over the weekend, that um, the, he's equivocating the bill that Germany owes NATO or owes us over you know lack of defense spending uh, per the NATO charter with the ridiculousness of the EU asking for 100 or more billion dollars from the Brits to leave their union, who have been nothing but a net creditor to the union, uh, to the EU for decades now. They've been paying in, the, the Brits have been paying in, you know, tens of billions of dollars into the EU to keep it funding, funded. And these people still think that they're entitled to even more of the Brits' wealth. And it was funny, as in that in that uh, Zero Hedge article that covering the, the, the latest version of their offer sheet, the EU's offer sheet, the I think it was a, it was the Minister of the Interior or something said, "Look, they're asking for they're asking for uh, for uh, for rights that even our own people don't have. And they want us to pay for these things. So these are rights that our, our people don't even have. Are they insane? <laughs> they, and apparently they are. But again, it's something I was talking about with Halsey the other night when I did a live chat, which is to say that Brexit isn't about Brexit. It's about Spain. It's about Italy. It's about Portugal. It's about Hungary. It's about Poland. Okay. So uh, you have to understand that, you know, the Germans now understand that they are really in a very precarious position because they are now going to have to truly hold up the entire EU on their own. And without any overt support from the United States, who's actually backing a splintering of the the European Union under Trump. And so this is why we're seeing um, this move by both France and Germany to try and cozy up to Putin. Putin's not having any uh, any of it. He's not he's not going to sit there and he's not obviously not saying, "Oh, well, thank you for actually letting me back into the club, guys. We really I really appreciate it and I'll do anything I can." No, Putin's like, "The hell with you. You want you want access to uh, to, to Russia start acting like adults." We're happy for you to act like adults. We would like you to act like adults. But you're going to have to act like adults. And uh, so. <laughs> I just love watching all this stuff play out. I really do. And uh, it, <laughs> I really do. I, do. I just adore it. it makes me, uh, just makes me smile. It's one of the few things in, in this life I think at this point that really makes me smile. Knowing that, uh, uh, and knowing full well that Trump and Putin are, are working behind the scenes to ensure that we do not have a nuclear World War III over Syria, uh, I, I, I can I can sleep a little bit better at night. It doesn't look like it at this point, but it's it. But all the cards are are starting to fall into place, and you'll you're going to see this unfold over the course of the next two or three months. All right, uh, 
one other thing real quick before we get to the charts and we get the GMLP's earnings, which is uh, which are important to me as go our LNG partners, a very important stock to my uh, former subscribers over at Resolute Wealth Letter. Uh, I wanted to just talk about Gazprom. Gazprom had their earnings this morning. They were okay. They weren't you know stellar or anything, but this is Gazprom. It's not re- you're not really buying it for the quarter to quarter earnings report. You're buying it for the geopolitical risk uh, and for the eventual movement of the flood of capital into Russia relative to the size of its market uh, over the course of the next you know, five to seven years. Uh, not happy with, the, with, with Gazprom trading below uh, um, 120 rubles today, but I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's indicative of anything really awful in the in the long run. And uh, so. But Gazprom and Shell, uh, uh, Royal Dutch Shell's management just uh, held a meeting together where they uh, where they agreed on a whole raft of projects and working groups and whatnot to deepen their relationship. So you can you can view this as as a uh, as a, a deepening of their strategic alliance pact that they uh that they signed the last year uh, or two years ago, sorry, two years ago, which is part of the reason why I like both companies and I like Shell as the, and Shell is really the only other major uh, integrated oil and gas company that I really like other than Gazprom. Uh, and, and Gazprom, and, and, and honestly being, you know, being long Gazprom or, or, or being, you know, an advocate for Gazprom is really just is, is as much a stick in the eye to the, uh, American media as it is in the French, uh, American French and German media as it is anything else, because I, I you, we all, we can see it happening that the the Russians are winning diplomatically and militarily and in a geopolitical sense everything that they've asked for, and yet still the price of Gazprom is trading in the gutter. This is just an it's an unbelievable opportunity for investors if they're willing to actually sit down and uh, think it through. So uh, love the fact that Gazprom and Shell are moving beyond just the Gamal LNG project. Uh, sorry, the Sakhalin uh, LNG project out in, in uh, uh, Vladivostok, uh, Kamchatka, and uh, which is north of, which is on the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is north of Vladivostok, but it, that they're working on a variety of other things as well. So you understand that, that that Shell is the leader in LNG technology as well as market share, and that is an incredible opportunity for Gazprom to gain access to technology that the rest of uh, the U.S. majors won't give them under other circumstances. This is why that's so important in a long-term sense. There's going to be a lot of uh, unconventional horizontal, uh, un- un- unconventional drilling uh, techniques that, that Shell has access to that they will share with Gazprom. You know, it's just that's what's going to happen. It's already happening. And that's why you're going to see uh, production out of Gazprom over the course of the next 10 years skyrocket as it feeds um, China and CPEC and the whole one one belt one road project and and everything else. So all right. So and then the last thing we're going to talk about right at the end, we're going to go over um, uh, go our LNG partners earnings report because it's a uh, it's it's important uh, to uh, a great number of people. All right. So let's talk about gold. We've got a monthly close uh, forming up in gold. This is I'm obviously doing this before the market close on the 31st of May. So you know this bar may move a little bit, but it's not going. I, the way trade gold is trading during U.S. hours at this point, it's pretty much not moving during U.S. hours. So I don't expect this to move very much from here. The European close has already happened, so, you know, whatever. What we have here, though, is interesting, is looking at the monthly chart, is that you do see these huge uh, long tails to the downside. This is this is indicative of really strong support. And anytime there's a washout in gold, that un- that we're uncovering buyers at these levels and then pushing and then are capable of not just uncovering a large supply of buyers, but then immediately pushing the price back up within the next week or two. That's very, very, that's a very, very good sign. And even though I still don't think that gold is ready to shine, I don't think it's ready for a new bull market yet because obviously we still haven't breached 1300 or we still haven't breached that level. There's a lot of work to do. What this is telling me is that any potential washout in gold that happens, if there's some kind of spasm of the monetary system i.e because well, i don't know the european union starts to break up then it's going to be short-lived because there's just such tremendous buying pressure underneath but understand that you know traders are savvy the chinese are savvy the russians are savvy they don't want to they don't they want to buy without moving price you know large buyers always want to buy without moving price it's retail that moves price okay and retail is not quite ready for prime time yet they're just not there, all right. And uh, I don't think that's—I don't think we're going to get there without another major catalyst, and we just don't have it yet. 
Trump at the G7 was an interesting catalyst, but it's only it's only a small one. Next week's British elections will be, um, or two weeks from now, or, no, next week, British elections will be another catalyst, small catalyst. I don't think it'll be a major one, though. Not like Brexit, not like Trump. Okay? Uh, so that's the interesting thing in gold. Now we, we turn around and we look at silver, and I'm, this is practically the same chart I put up a couple of weeks ago. All I did was update this bar and then put in these levels. Because what we have here now is a, uh, what we have to be worried about is, there's a couple of things that I, about this. So we had this downtrend. We had a two-bar reversal, right? We closed within two bars of this high. And then we immediately got another two-bar reversal to the downside right here. Um, and oil is starting to sell off again, you know, and, and whatnot. So it's pulling silver down. We got a move back down and tested support at $16 earlier in the month. And it's very strong. Um, and uh, this bar is important. This bar is actually the one that's, you know, been negated. So now we're looking at, okay, so where can we close next? Well, we really don't want to close below 16 bucks on a monthly closing basis because then we're looking at 1575 here and then possibly, you know, for a return to sub $14. Um, so to see this strong bounce and close here towards the top of this bar is great. doesn't mean that silver is ready to move much past $18. There's still a lot of work that has to be done here, right? But this, but closing this month near the top of this bar makes it really easy for um, for silver to start the month to break above this high, and then that cements that sixteen eleven is really the absolute lowest price on a you know in a in any kind of rational trading scenario, and uh, you know one sigma trading uh, behavior that 16.11 is now the low for the next month. So this, this is a very good setup for a move back towards 18 and uh, to trade in this range for a little while between, you know, um, 16.50 and 18.50 or so in this range and, and set this up, which is nice. It still may fall off later, but at least we know we're, we're looking at that for right now, okay? Uh, high probability of breaking this month's high next month, tomorrow, as a matter of fact. And then that, probability wise says okay well the possibility of breaking both the previous high and the previous low is only seven percent so there you go we got a 93 percent chance that that uh 1611 is going to be the low for june which means that you know which is a good sign you know that we're not going to see lower prices than that uh that's all it says but it's better than nothing all right the last thing i want to talk about because i'm going to start adding this chart in because i think it's really important it's really interesting at this point and i'm also now letting you all know that I think that Bitcoin is now functionally important to the world monetary system. I've been involved with Bitcoin since the very, very, very beginning. And had I believed in it then, I wouldn't need to do this podcast because I would be a billionaire. Oh, well, life's a bitch. So um, that being said, looking at what's happening in the world today from a capital flow perspective, looking at as we approach the event horizon of the fall of confidence in central banks, political institutions, and all of it. The whole current world order, which, you know, if you're a regular, if you listen to this podcast on a regular basis and you read any of my work and you agree with me in any way, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't, and this is a first time listener, and you don't know what I'm talking about, well, understand that that's the theme here. That's the major theme, that the world monetary and political system is in flux. It's broken. It's been broken since 2008. And now the next phase of the breakdown, we're reaching the next event horizon within the series of breakdowns that have to occur in order for a new monetary system to take to emerge over the course of the next you know, five to 10 years, depending on, you know, depending on the sequence of events. And Bitcoin is now, I think, absolutely, or at least cryptocurrencies in general, are becoming a major factor in where we're going. And as a long-time gold bug and a long-time precious metals bug, you know, it was always that I always believed in Exeter's Pyramid. And I still do believe in Exeter's Pyramid, right? Where gold is the thing that liquefies or that, that undergirds the monetary system and everything else is built like an inverted pyramid as layers of credit on top of base money. And gold is base money. And then you have, and then you have, you know, reserves and then you have bonds and then you have stocks and then you have commodities and then you have derivatives. So cryptocurrencies, because they are, a, they're not, a, we call them virtual is, is, is unfair. They are a digital analog of gold, okay, in the way that they are brought into being. 
um, that because of that, and because they are not controlled by failing government institutions, the value of them is potentially unreal as capital leaks away from the monetary system. The, this chart is telling you that that process is underway. Now, is it going to be volatile? Yes. Are we going to see more bars like this one? Oh my God, yes. But we're going to see those at ever higher numbers because of the way the Bitcoin blockchain and the amount of Bitcoins that are available relative to the size of the demand for them. $2,300 is going to look cheap one day. It just is. And I was unconvinced of this um, back in, you know, 2015, 2014, when Chinese capital flight first started to, to, to rear its ugly head back in the late 2015. I still didn't believe it. I still thought it was possible that we'd get, we'd get another crash back into the, you know, the one or two hundreds. I was wrong. I'm happy to be wrong because I identified in Bitcoin immediately when I first read about it. Like three days after they released the beta <laughs> that I thought it had the potential to change the world. And now I'm ready to now I'm ready to say that it is changing the world. But uh, and this chart is proof of that. You're going to add zeros to this chart over the course of the next. We're going to add orders of magnitude to the Bitcoin chart. Whether Bitcoin winds up being the cryptocurrency of choice or not is a is a different story. It, it inherently has problems within the way its blockchain is designed. It was really alpha code that went viral. It was never designed to handle the transaction volume it's currently trying to handle. And technically, there's a lot of problems with Bitcoin itself as a digital currency, which is why you're seeing these massive moves in price. And there are better ones out there that are better designed than Bitcoin. Whether or not they, they take market share or not is oh, a different story. right? But I think it's very important that everybody that's listening to me understand that this, that this is something you need to be familiarizing yourself with right now. And you need to be looking at a way to diversify your cash savings holdings between cash, precious metals, and cryptocurrencies. Period. We'll have more on this in each podcast. All right, let's move forward. The last thing I want to talk about is GMLP. So Golar LNG Partners is a master limited partnership shipping company that um, specializes in liquefied natural gas. They have a fleet of both LNG carriers that moves liquefied natural gas from one place to the other, from where it's produced and to where it's consumed. They also have what they call floating storage and regasification units. They're just, they're all, these are all ships. And then the last thing that's what's interesting about uh, GMLP to me, long-term as a growth prospect that you rarely have in a master limited partnership is breaking into a completely under, uh, uncharted technology and market presence. And that is floating LNG terminals, converting ships into floating LNG terminals, which they, they are on the verge of putting the first one in the world uh, at sea in September off the coast of Cameroon. Brilliant company. So uh, most of this commentary is going to be for my subscribers who have been around with me for a long time, who understand this company well, because we've been in it. Uh, I've been in this company since almost the beginning of Resolute Wealth. I think it was the second company I put in the portfolio behind Gazprom. Um, and I, I, I think that this, this company is, 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 uh, is tremendous. So right now, they, they've got a perfect storm of bad news. Uh, you know, they've got one of their, one of their ships uh, that they uh, did a capital raise for to buy last year uh, has not been put into service yet. And so that and so they're having to sell that back to their parent company, uh, Golar LNG Limited. Uh, they're, but they're going to use the proceeds from that, which they've already raised the capital for, but that capital is not returning anything right now. It's just sitting there dead in the water waiting to be uh, deployed productively. Uh, but that's going to be used to buy a stake in the first LN, floating LNG terminal, uh, the Healy Episeo, which, again, like I said, is going into production in uh off coast of Cameroon for Perenco in September is the uh, the date that we're that they're targeting at this point, and that project will start immediately, and is a very very lucrative project. So effectively, that same capital that they raised to buy to 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 buy the the Golar Tundra, they're using to buy a quarter stake in this floating LNG terminal, which is a much higher uh, return internal return on investment than uh, than the other ship 
but it does mute the long-term growth prospects of the company because they don't have both, right? So uh, the coverage ratio for this quarter was 0.89, as you all well know, for a master limited partnerships, anything below 1.2 is considered a little, is considered sketchy. Anything under one is really bad. Uh, but this is mostly because of uh, lost revenue due to dry, due to scheduled dry docks, uh, changing of recharge chartered ships, and this uh, and and other things not coming online at the same time. So it's really, it's it's most of that drop in coverage from a very healthy 1.5 in Q4 to 0.89 today in Q1 is a, a bunch of one-offs which they have the money to absorb in time. And their guidance is that they'll be back to a much healthier coverage ratio in Q2, so there's no worry there. The lower the coverage ratio, the more the more in trouble the dividend is in a company like this. And MLPs, the main reason you're buying them is that they distribute 90% of their operating profit back to shareholders on a quarterly basis. Okay, This company, at current prices, yields nearly 12%. It's paying... Two thirty one a year, two dollars and thirty one cents a year on a stock price of around nineteen fifty. It's one of the most unbelievable values in the markets today. So, uh, so in the good news, they rechartered the Golar Grand, which came off of uh, uh, which came off of contract, and it's already been rechartered. And so that's a, so the LNG carrier market is starting to improve. I like that. Uh, if they and if we get the good news that they've rechartered the other two ships that need to be rechartered. Uh, and put on long-term contracts at good prices, then this will lift the stock price well back above 20 bucks, and we won't uh, have any problems. And the long-term bullish thesis on this company will be intact. If all the bad news that's currently out there continues in the same direction, i.e. Uh, the floating LNG terminal doesn't go, doesn't deploy in September, and they can't recharter the ships and everything else, then the stock's absolutely going to break down below this point of uh, of support which is eighteen dollars and thirty two cents a share and the dividend will be in, would be in trouble and everything else so for long-term holders of the stock uh eighteen thirty two on a clo- monthly closing basis in june is your uh is your action level okay that would constitute a two bar reversal on the quarterly chart it would be bad uh and you'd have to be looking i would and i would be looking if you if you have the ability to ride it out do so if you don't don't is what it comes down to. Because with a stock that p- pays as, as handsomely as this one does, um, you know, you have to the you have to, to be uh, to be worried about cost of capital issues. So uh, I've got an article into editorial over at Seeking Alpha right now. It should be posted up by the, the end of the day or early tomorrow, covering all of this stuff in more detail. Uh, you can read it there. You can follow me. Uh, um, you can follow me as, as Tom Luongo over at Seeking Alpha, and. Uh, and then that article will get posted to my blog over tomalongo.me. It'll get posted. I'll post it everywhere. So you guys will be able to find it. Um, but understand that that's the situation of Golar. The, 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 uh, the earnings report was not good. This is kind of the first time in the seven years this company has been in existence that they've had a bad earnings report, to be honest with you. I mean, while the stock, you see the, the huge downdraft in price here. I mean, this stock used to be $35 a share and hit a low of $750. While the quarterly reports were all good every week, every quarter they were all good. They were being sold with the rest of the MLP sector on worries that the entire market, that the entire um, uh, sector was not going to be able to ever raise capital again. Because when you pay out 90% of your operating income as, as, uh, as distributions to your shareholders, you only have one or two ways to grow. You either issue more equity or you issue more debt or you issue an issue of a combination of the both. You don't have operating reserves that you can just go and buy new ships with. You know, you're honor bound by your charter to send to, that's why you split. That's why parent companies create MLPs underneath them is it's, which is to split the profits of the company out and distribute it as to shareholders. It, but that also leaves the master limited partnership in a very precarious position. If the market turns against them, right? Because then, and they, there will be some, volatility in the stock price but if the company is well managed and their operating revenue is good and their operating income is good and and they're and they've chartered their and they've, they've managed their their book of business properly then the market sells them off when there's absolutely no need to and you can pick them up at sink bid prices i had people buy in this range while this was happening we 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 tripled down on this company uh in the resolute wealth and uh i know for a fact that subscribers picked this bottom near eight dollars a share and the cotton the stock was yielding 37 <laughs> percent 
So, and we sold that same tranche earlier in the year, 2350. So, I'm giving you an idea. Then an 18 month return of like 91%. All right. All right. So, that's what we're talking about. So, uh, watch for. There's not much to watch for right now. Well, it's, uh, we'll, we'll get back together in a couple of days uh, and we'll and we'll look the, the charts over and see what the early price action of gold and silver are. Uh, I would say watch for a move above 2350 on a daily closing basis in Bitcoin for resumption of the bull trend. If it, that does not happen, then we're probably looking at a potential washout to like, I don't know, 1800 or something like that. But it doesn't matter. That, that would be an interesting buying point. FYI. All right. We'll talk, we'll talk to you guys soon. You guys... uh. Uh, be good and keep your stick on the eyes.